Hi, Ben. I'm a huge fan. Um, so I've seen a lot of graphics that say Ben Shapiro for President 2020. Uh, would you ever consider running for president or any other public office, and why or why not? <laughs> Well, I mean, I believe that there's been a constitutional amendment put in place that means you either have to be a reality TV star or a relative of a current, of a former president in order to run. So I'm not sure if I qualify. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't rule, I wouldn't rule anything out. I wouldn't rule anything out. Eleanor wants to know, if you were to become president, what laws and policies would you put in place, specifically with regards to abortion, transgenderism, gay marriage, et cetera? Well, I mean, it, it depends on the kind of laws that you're talking about. So. If I were president, the, the law that I would pursue on same-sex marriage is not a federal law on same-sex marriage. It would be a federal attempt to move the government out of the business of marriage and to protect religious freedom, which is what I think needs to be protected. Uh, and the reason I say that is because if I can put in place a law that enshrines traditional marriage again, unless it's a constitutional amendment, then the left is immediately going to come back in and just get rid of that law as soon as I'm gone, and they're going to go back to status quo ante. So what I would suggest instead is disestablishing marriage at the government level. And instead, you want your church to perform only traditional marriages? Great. We'll have a law in the books that says that you can do whatever you want on this issue. Uh, I mean, it's called the First Amendment. We shouldn't have to have a law for it. But we do need Religious Freedom Restoration Act on the state level and the federal level. Uh, as far as transgenderism, I would not encode in federal policy the, the perverse notion that the federal government is in charge of paying for your sex change, for example. Like we did uh, for Chelsea Manning? Yeah, I think that's absurd. Um, and I, I would also not, I, I would also fight very hard the, the ridiculous notion that the Civil Rights Act is supposed to cover, the Title IX of the Civil Rights Act is supposed to cover transgenderism. You can't have it both ways. Either the Civil Rights Act is based on discrimination against women, or it's based on there's no distinction between women and men. You cannot do both of those things mm. uh, at once. Uh, I'd, I'd be mostly concerned on these scores, it would be mostly about preserving religious freedom rather than, and getting the government out of the business of funding everything altogether. So that, that sort of takes care of the problem more generally. A lot fewer executive orders. I'm not a huge fan of executive orders because I think that executive orders, especially if you have Congress, I mean, right now he's got a majority in Congress. So you should be able to pass some pretty significant laws. Um, you know, first, first order of business on an executive level, uh, I, I think a lot of what Trump is doing, you know, as far as attempting to build up the military is correct. Uh, I think slashing regulations is correct. Uh, I think that you know, an attempt to restructure entitlements would be very high on the priority list if you're going to do it to it early in your presidency, obviously, uh, because you're going to feel blowback for doing it. And if we don't fix the entitlement problem, then the country's bas the government's basically done. I mean, 80% of our budget is entitlements, essentially. Only 20% is defense. Um, yeah, I think that I, I would also be, be – I would have a basic rule. And the basic rule would be I will not sign any bill that is longer than three pages and not in plain language. I want the American people to understand what it is that people are voting for and what they're signing. I would also fire half the executive branch immediately. I would disband not just three departments, I would disband a lot of de departments. And I won't bother naming them because oops. So, the, so, so I, I would get rid, I think that the government by executive fiat is gross. I don't think that's what the presidency was designed to do. And I would try to take structural measures to undermine the power of the federal government so that the person who came after me could not, re, could not revamp it. I would, I would devolve a lot of power to the states. I would devolve a lot of power to localities. Um, as I say, I would, I would try to break the public sector unions as fast as possible because I think that they're bankrupting the country. Um, and a lot of the, the, the stuff I could do inside the executive branch would be stuff addressed to the executive branch. So it wouldn't be addressed to you know, areas that Congress has already spoken on. But you know, I, I would disband the EPA. I would disband the Department of Education. I would disband the Department of Energy. If Congress wants to pass laws along those lines, Congress can damn well pass laws along those lines. But the idea that a bunch of unelected bureaucrats are super giant experts in all this stuff and they get to make all the regulations and rules without ever having to be exposed to the public eye, I think that's really gross. So that would be, as president, I think that's the first job of the president. The president really has two jobs under the Constitution, right? It's to enforce the laws and to make sure that we have national security. Those are really his two big jobs under the Constitution, and those would be the two that I take seriously. I would be maybe the first president in history trying to undermine the power of the executive branch on behalf of the legislature uh, and, uh, and simultaneously strengthen the military on behalf of uh, national security. Shapiro 2020! <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe 2024. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, hi, this is, I'm fangirling right now. So I can't see it right now. Um, 
How would you address a person who wants to argue uh, about morality with a humanistic base instead of a theistic one? I've been reading a lot of Francis Schaeffer. I don't know if you're familiar with Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, so arguing on a humanistic basis as opposed to a religious one ignores the fact that humanism is a direct outgrowth of the Judeo-Christian value system. This is the big problem with secular humanism. Secular humanism is fine so far as it goes, but it is, but from an atheistic viewpoint, and most atheist philosophers are honest enough to acknowledge this. Richard Dawkins acknowledges this. Sam Harris acknowledges this. Uh, uh, Harari acknowledges this. Most people who are honest atheistic philosophers realize that science does not dictate morality. Right? There's a very good case to be made for tyranny, slavery, and genocide just according to the rules of nature. So this idea that we can inherently discover in nature that people are equal and deserve not to be enslaved, if that were true, then most of human history would not be dominated by all of these tremendous evils. So it was a Judeo-Christian value system that created secular humanism. Secular humanism is fine, as I say, so far as it goes, but if it fails to recognize where it came from, and it really came from one verse in Genesis that says that all human beings are made in God's image, which is what makes us special and worthwhile, uh, then they are failing to acknowledge the fundamental root of Western civilization. Hi, Ben. Sorry. <laughs> my I think there's a microphone going around, so it'll, it'll come around to you. My name's Francesca Bailey, and my question is, do you think the shooting at the congressional baseball game was a result of hate speech rhetoric toward Donald Trump and the GOP? Okay, so a couple of things on this. I don't believe in the concept of hate speech as a general rule. Uh, and I think that we on the right should be very careful about mimicking the snowflakery that we see from the other side. So I've been on enough college campuses where people say things like, if I go on a college campus and I say a man is a man and a woman is a woman and they can't magically change, uh, then this is considered hate speech by a lot of people on the left and I'll be protested and they'll try to ban me from campus. If I say that Black Lives Matter is a movement that has gotten a lot of black folks killed by preventing proper policing that is necessary for law-abiding black people, uh, then th I'll be banned because it's quote-unquote hate speech. I think we need to be very careful with this. So I, I discussed this actually at length on my podcast today. Uh, I think that there are basically three types of speech two of them uh, that are in question. Two of them are dangerous, one of them is not. Okay, the, the two types that are dangerous are the open advocacy of violence, right? The Antifa kind of stuff, go out there, kill people, hurt people, punch a Nazi, right? That, that kind of stuff is definitely dangerous. Um, it, I'm always loath to attribute any one crazy person's, you know, to, to attribute an entire climate to the activity of one person, something the left really likes to do. Oklahoma City bombing, it's Rush Limbaugh's fault. JFK is assassinated. It's the climate of hate, of, of hate in the country. I hate that kind of stuff. But if you are advocating violent rhetoric, then you should. Then that is not worthwhile. Second is defending violence, right? If you are somebody who says, "Well, I sort of understand where the guy's coming from," and you do see this sort of rhetoric on a, a fairly regular basis. I think Kathy Griffin sort of falls into this area, the the, the holding up of Trump's head and all of that. Uh, you know that that kind of speech. Where I get dicey on this is when people start saying things like, "Well, you know, the left will they call themselves the resistance? Isn't that terrible?" Guys, like six months ago, we were calling ourselves the Tea Party, which is an active anti-government resistance group historically. So, like, no. Uh, you know, when, when, the, when the left says that Trump is a fascist or he's a tyrant or any of this kind of stuff, I don't care. I don't think that that drives violence. And I think that we have to be very careful that we don't end up in a situation where we're attempting to ban speech ourselves because we think that it's quote unquote dangerous. So that, that's sort of the breakdown in terms of speech. Hi, Ben. Um, thanks for tweeting me the other day. I literally cried. And <laughs> true story. And secondly, do you believe that there, we have a wage gap, like a current wage gap? Uh, between men and women? Yeah. Okay, so there is no wage gap between men and women for women who are straight out of college and, uh, and are single and do not have kids. Uh, the wage gap not only does not exist, there is, if anything, <laughs> there is, if anything, a reverse wage gap. So according to a study quoted in Time Magazine in 2010, women are earning 8% more than men in 50 major cities across the United States on average coming straight out of college. Um, you know, the, the truth is that women take more time off from work, they take different jobs than men. Uh, a lot of high paying jobs for men involve men going into really dangerous places and doing really dangerous things uh, that women either don't want to do or aren't physically qualified to do. I mean, I'm sorry to break it to the left, but it turns out that on average women are not as strong as men, so you know, they're going to be more male firemen than, than fire women, just as a general rule. Um, you know, when it comes to, the, 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 the reality is that the wage gap is it entirely disappears once you factor out the types of jobs that are being done, the amount of time in the workforce, the amount of time taken off, the number of hours worked. My wife, again, not to use her as an example for everything, my wife's a perfect example of this. She took off a year uh, between her residency, uh, between med school and residency. Uh, she, sorry, 
between second and third year of medical school. She took off a year to take care of our first baby, and then she took off a few months uh, before she, after she had our second baby uh, before she went back to residency. That, I took off a week both times. Uh, and that's not because I'm so strong and tough or because she's so weak and fragile. She's really tough. Uh, it's because my wife wanted to spend time with our kids, and that was her choice, and thank God we were able to make that happen. So that's not... You know, that, that, that is not a rip on women at all. In fact, I think it's glorious that so many women want to take time out to do the most important thing that any human being can do, which is raise their children. Good evening. My name is Marietta. Um, what are the three most influential books? Oh, okay, so I think that if, if, so I think that the three, two of the three are really easy. So the Federalist Papers, um, you should actually read. Uh, and it's not just a bad book assignment, it's actually imperative. Uh, to understand how the Constitution works. Uh, there's a book called Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, uh, which is like 150 pages long. You can read it in a couple of sittings. It's, it's really great stuff. Um, and I would say I usually recommend as, as my third, The Quest for Cosmic Justice by Thomas Sowell, uh, which is a relatively easy read. Uh, and also it, it, the basic premise of it is all about why the left has this transformational view of politics, why they think that government can be used to solve any problem under the sun. And those three books, you read those, and that gives you a pretty solid grounding in conservative thought. <laughs> Dude, I can't recommend my own book. It's on sale on Amazon for eleven ninety nine. dollars uh, this, So it was Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt was the economics book, the Federalist Papers, and then the, and then, uh, the, uh, the Soul book. In regards to the in 